Today I'm going to talk to you about embryo networks, computational development, and neural simulation. Uh, this is uh, representative of work being done in the past five years in the DevaWorm group. Uh, the DevaWorm group is part of the Open Worm Foundation and the Orthogonal Research and Education Lab. We started in 2018 with a paper on embryo networks, which we'll talk about, and then talking about developmental connectomes. And then more recently, we've done papers on hypergraphs and tensegrity networks. And we'll talk about what all those are in a little bit. So the motivating question is, how do we characterize the process of proliferation, cellular interactions, and functional differentiation in embryogenesis? And here you can see an example of a C. elegans embryo uh, developing from the two cell stage. And when you get to about 200 minutes of development, you start to get the formation of this comma, which is the second morphology from the right. And then at the very right, you have this pretzel phenotype, which is where the, uh, what starts to look like the larval worm starts to form within the egg. And then this leads to this structure down at the bottom of the title page here with this network on it, but you can clearly see that that's a curled up C. elegans larva just ready to hatch out of the egg. So that's the core time course of C. elegans development. And we'll be using examples from C. elegans as well as other organisms in this talk. So this is an example of a newly hatched C. elegans. This is this spiral that it forms, the larva forms just before the egg hatches. And you can form a network out of this using different landmarks. This, this is a microscopy image. You can take that microscopy image, find landmarks, and build a network. And of course here, the network is the nearest neighbor downstream in, in the phenotype or in the anatomy from the head. So you can see that there are networks that kind of spiral outwards. So you can characterize different uh, topologies in that way. You can also look at something like the mouse blastocyst, which is an early stage of mouse development where you have this inner cell mass and this outer edge of cells. And here you can characterize the cells in different, in different uh, classifications. Uh, depending on the cell's state. So if, say, we're interested in the inner cell mass versus the uh, outer uh, ring of cells there, uh, we want to maybe map out some of the connections. Maybe they have chemical uh, connections. Maybe they have other types of relationships that we want to characterize. We can do this using a network topology as well. <clears throat> so these are embryo networks, and they capture anatomical structures and functional relationships. Now, one of the things about embryo networks that differentiate them from uh, maybe a more static type of network rep representation, and here we have these static representations of a single instance in development, but these networks often grow because the number of cells often grow in the embryo, and they change shape and they change position. So what we need to do is use something akin to what they call new world networks, which are actually networks from the uh, brain network literature. And these are networks that expand in, in terms of their number of nodes with time. So as time goes on, you get, especially if you're characterizing single cells, uh, you get more and more cells, you get more complexity in your graph, and you need to account for that in your representation. So typically we can take images of different, and we'll see this later, of different stages of development and compare the networks. And we need to account for that in our representation but there, there are a number of ways to do that. So if you think just about the connectivity, though, what does this reveal? Why are we doing this? So it actually reveals three things, and maybe more, but these are the three main points. It reveals anatomical and developmental lineage proximity. So we're dealing with a lineage tree of cells. As the cells divide and they uh, expand in, in number, they, this is an unfolding lineage tree. So we're not going to show lineage trees right here, but you can imagine that as cells divide, they represent this relationship with their mother cell and their, uh, and their other daughter cells that they produce. And so we can characterize all that with networks. And it makes it a little bit different than a typical static network topology because you have these connections across time as well as space. You can also characterize cells with a common function. So in the mouse example, the mouse blastocyst, the inner cell mass, we can characterize the relationships between the inner cell mass, but also with other cells in the embryo. And so we can actually get those functional categories worked out. Finally, you find uh, connections between symmetrical pairs. 
And C. elegans, that's important because there are functional symmetrical pairs of cells that we want to be able to characterize their relationship versus maybe the relationship of one of those pair members with an, uh, an adjacent cell. And so we can, um, you know, tease out all those relationships with our network, but this network connectivity gives us a, a unique tool to do that. So to recap, if you're not familiar with how cell division works, but especially in the, in the case of like a graph theoretical representation, uh, there's a term we can use uh, called bifurcation. And this is uh, going from a single network to a bar pi, bar pi, uh, bipartite network. And so this asks the question, how many parts does the network fragment into over time? And so you can see here we have a bar bipartite structure. We have a bifurcation of one cell into two cells. And so we have this, say for example, we have a single cell, we have a bunch of cells around it, they form a network, and then that cell divides. That's a bifurcation of that node in the, in the network. And so now we need to represent that bifurcation event going from a single network to a bipartite network in that area. So we need to actually account for this in the uh, representation. So as I mentioned before, uh, we also have this problem of the graph diameter expanding because there's a growth in the number of nodes. So as the cells divide and they differentiate, but especially as they divide and proliferate, the number of nodes increases in the network. And so we need to have a good accounting for that. And the New World Networks approach is just one possible approach to that. Um, local connectivity tends to increase as the nodal density increases. And global modularity increases as we get differentiation and these bifurcation events. So we have these bifurcations of cells that sort of uh, enforces a bipartite structure on the network. We have expansion of structure with cell division, and we have an initial condition of a single cell, but we get, not only do we get these uh, division events, but we get differentiation events where the cells uh, fall into different categories eventually. So you get all these nondescript cells proliferating, but then you start to get cells of different categories start to emerge. And we'll talk about the challenges involved in that a little bit later as well. But to say that there's this issue of modularity, meaning that there's there are these modules that evolve or that sort of develop over time that represent different tissues or different regions of the uh, network. And so these things need to be accounted for in the representation. So this is our mathematical treatment of embryo networks. This comes from our work in 2018. This is a basic embryo network. So the idea is you get this uh, point cloud of, of uh, cell centroids and you characterize the relationships between those cell centroids by either you know, some sort of relationship between the cells in terms of space or in terms of time or in terms of something like chemical signaling. But regardless, we need to have some sort of mathematical representation. So we can use cell tracking data, which uh, scans an image. Uh, it produces a bunch of cell centroids from microscopy data. And you, so you get this point cloud, and you have to characterize these cells in 3D space. And of course, cell tracking does that automatically. So you get it embedded into three-dimensional anatomical space, where you have uh, three anatomical dimensions, which are x, y, z in this representation. This five tuple then has those three dimensions of space, but also two dimensions of something else. And that something else is time. So each time point at which we're measuring our data or time point development. So as we move through development, that time increases. And context, which is the last uh, parameter. And, and context is interesting because it can be anything you want it to be. Uh, it can be, you know, some sort of set of relationships some sort of identity marker, some sort of uh, other type of marker. And so it's it's a pretty flexible methodology. We have a Jupyter notebook at dvorm.github.io. You can find more about it. Um, yeah. Also, if you go to the paper, you can uh, find a link to it in the paper, in the methods. So this gives us this five-dimensional data structure. And this is an example of how you can use context. So we take data from this point cloud this is XYZ coordinates. These XYZ coordinates are anatomical, so it's anterior, posterior, dorsal, ventral, and left, right. And so you put these in a context, you average over these points for different cells. So if you, in C. elegans, you can identify specific cells. 
and you can average over many observations of many different embryos to get average locations. There are other ways to normalize the data as well, which is, you know, it depends on what you're trying to do or, you know, how you think is best, uh, you know, to represent this, these data, because these are raw data and they're collected from cell tracking. And, you know, you want to be able to characterize a cell as being in a certain position. It's actually quite important to get the right position or at least approximate it. So that's, that's the first step. And then we move on to characterizing these uh, lineage trees. And so these lineage trees in C. elegans are, again, very simple. They're binary trees that have exhibit division events. As you can see, we've characterized it with a binary code. So you have a single cell. You have a, a division event where we have a zero lineage and a one lineage, and then sublineages of zero, 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 one, and then one, zero, one, one. And so these are, this is the formation of these sublineages, which will eventually contribute to these sort of modules that, this modularity that results eventually in the, in the lineage tree as it divides. But we have this time dimension, which goes down the lineage tree. So it's very simple. There are different layers to the lineage tree, and those layers then can be characterized with T. And then I, which is the spatial context, uh, which has this uh, sort of the lineage tree in C. elegans is organized along an uh, anterior, posterior, axial order. Uh, it doesn't have to be that. You can rearrange it in different ways. Uh, you can build trees that are organized uh, based on their spatial, more explicit spatial locations, or maybe some of the you know signaling gradients that you might be interested in. And once you get outside of C. elegans, these conditions change. Sometimes it's harder to identify <clears throat> single cell lineages, like in the mouse. They, they, uh, people have worked on approximating cell lineages, but they're not absolute. So this is a, an issue that comes up. Also, we have this I, which is the context, and that can be a number of things. So, um, you know, this is a flexible approach, but it also comes with some caveats. So we take that five-dimensional data structure and we can build these networks. And so this is uh, an example of spatial connectivity. And this is an example of perhaps an interactome example that I talked about before, where you have uh, chemical signaling locally between cells. And you want to know what are the nearest cells, not only in a single static example of an em a stage of development in an embryo, but across different uh, layers of that lineage tree. So as we saw before, we have different layers of the lineage tree. And here we can see that these different layers of the lineage tree are embedded in this network, a three-dimensional network space. So for example, we have this ABPR lineage, which is actually we can go from ABP, and then ABP is connected to ABPR, and then ABPR is connected to ABPRA, ABPRP, ABP, or ABPRA, and ABPRP. And you can see that there's a, uh, a, spa a set of spatial dimensions here, or a set of spatial uh, coordinates. And you, what you get is you get connections between those spatial locations, which actually also gives you an angle of differentiation or angle of uh, division. And so you can use that sort of information as well. So this topology contains not only lineage tree information and proximity information, but other types of information that you can mine from. And so this is an example on the right of these two subtrees that are emerging, what they call AB and P1 in the C. elegans embryo. And so uh, as those emerge, you start to see connect, uh, connectivity differences. P1 cells tend to be connected to P1, AB tend to be connected to AB, but there's overlap as you can see. And this again is this circular graph on the right is just based on this uh, distance metric uh, information. So that's the only criterion we're using for connectivity. But you can see that it starts to form two modules and maybe a few more modules uh, as we as we go forward. You can start to see that there's local connectivity in different areas because the cells, you know, they're, they're in, they're not in uniform distributions within the embryo. Uh, so they're not necessarily uniform sizes either. So you start to see these modules start to emerge. And we can describe that uh, pretty well using using uh, complex network theory. So next we come to the question of what kind of a network is it? If you're familiar with 
complex network theory, you know that there are different types of networks that emerge from data. So if we look at different types of complex networks, you know, we, we start with the assumption that the random network has nothing, like has no structure, basically. So a lot of times people will generate these random networks uh, to represent sort of a, a, a sort of a null condition or sort of a default condition where there's it's not a uniformly connected graph where everything is the same distance. It's a randomly connected graph. So that means that there's variation in, in the position of the nodes, but it doesn't have any structure to it. Now, we can assume that it's random, but it's probably not. And I know from doing analysis, and, and you can see this in some of the papers, that the C. elegans embryo is not random. It's not a random graph. And it continues to be less random over developmental time. So, you know, very early on, you may find uh, some random signature, but not really because you get these, you already start to get these two anatomical poles very early in development. Um, but what kind of a network is it? So this, uh, you know, looking at in terms of connectivity, we have scale-free networks, which have been well characterized, and small world networks, which have been well characterized. Uh, scale-free networks means that there's no characteristic uh, sort of length or number of connections per node. So you get these patterns where there's this emergence of sort of hierarchical uh, relationships. So some cells are more connected than others, which could mean that they're clusters of cells. It could also mean that they're uh, cells that have some functional uh, significance locally. Uh, and then you get small world networks where this hierarchical relationship is heightened and you start to get these hubs of activity or hubs of organization. And so there, that's, that's a signal of very strong modularity. And if you're familiar with the C. elegans connectome, the small world effect has been des described in the C. elegans connectome in different papers. Uh, that small world connect connectivity emerges in the developmental connectome. Uh, it, it, it takes a while for it to emerge. So the very first steps of a uh, developmental connectome you don't really see that small world organization, but by the time you get towards a mature connectome, you do begin to see that sort of uh, organization. So we can actually look at these different network types. Uh, this is uh, from Staub et al. Graph theoretical model of a sensory motor connectome in zebrafish. And so this is actually from zebrafish, these data, but they apply to C. elegans as well, both the connectome and the embryo network. So we can actually look at the somatic ner and nervous system networks in the adult C. elegans. So this is an example from the OpenORM browser. If you're not familiar with it, you can go to browser.openorm.org and you can explore the worm. You can explore the muscles, the body, uh, sort of the body wall and the muscles. You can explore the nervous system. Uh, the center image is, is an image of the nervous system with its connections its neurons and connections. And then below you see another version of that. You can spin it around in three dimensions so you can explore different relationships. And so one of the insights that this gives us is this gives us some context for our embryo networks, which become these uh, somatic networks in the adult, and then these uh, developmental connectomes, which become the full connectome in C. elegans. And so C. elegans is a nice tractable organism. It has around a thousand cells in the body, in the somatic network in, in adulthood, and it has about 300 cells in the uh, con adult connectome. In the developmental connectome and the develop and the embryo network have fewer cells to deal with. So this is a tractable kind of network analysis we can do. Plus we know kind of what the path is from development to adulthood. We also know that these organisms are eutelic so that means they have the same number of cells from organism to organism, and they have this sort of de deterministic division uh, uh, division program that you know doesn't like vary. So unless you have a, a mutant on your hands, they generally every lineage tree produces the same set of cells in the same roughly the same position. So it's a very easy system to work with. And so building these networks from C. elegans is especially then you know it's fortuitous because you can see these relationships without having to do too much sort of guesswork. So I told you then 
that we have these somatic networks, these embryo networks, and we have these uh, connectomes or neuronal networks. And so one of the things we can do as we can look at, and we have data for these that are publicly available. Uh, other groups have collected a lot of data on this, and we've the deworm group has been involved in sort of mining these data and, and building these kind of models. So one thing we have is this uh, point cloud of embryo uh, cells, and so this is you know on this is raw data. I just wanted to show the kind of the shape of the data to give you an idea of what we have, and then we average those cells out because they have certain identities and we can find uh, sort of a mean cell centroid and then build these embryo networks from this. This is just a, a raw example. We start from a single cell when we get these cell divisions and then this is representative of all of development or all of embryogenesis. So all the cells in embryogenesis up to I think 600 minutes. And the point being is that you can build these embryo networks but then what you can do is you can go into those embryo networks because you have the cell identities and you can start to look at the cells that will become the nervous system, will become the connectome. And so you can look at some of these uh, emerging connectomes. And this is an example of a connectome of only a handful of cells relative to the uh, mature connectome. And you can look at these sort of the patterns that they start to form. So as we know in development, uh, we first get a neural tube, and this is, I'm talking about mammalian development and uh, vertebrate development. Uh, you get a neural tube, which is a folding uh, activity, and then you get these, uh, you get like a, a notochord or, a, you know, a sort of a neural crest, and then that it forms a basis for most of the uh, connectome in, in uh, vertebrates. So you get these uh, you know, you get these cells at the top, you get these cells down the down the cord, and that, that forms your spinal column and your central nervous system. And then everything else builds off of that. And then C. elegans, you can see that there are these sort of axes of uh, neural cells, and these are newly differentiated neuronal cells. So when you build a connectome uh, in development, you're building from these embryonic cells, and they differentiate into neural cells. And then they form these two along these two axes. You can see at the top, this is a along the left right axis and the anterior posterior axis. So you have two axes of cells. And then in the three dimensional view, you see that there is some dorsal ventral uh, bias for each of these that kind of goes diagonally, uh, dorsally, and ventrally. So you get these two axes. And so these will eventually form what we see in the adult, which is that we have a, a cluster of cells at the head cluster of cells at the tail, and then a bunch of cells along this midline that are all connected by um, long distance connections or short distance connections. So we've uh, written, uh, well, th these are the two papers down at the bottom. The first one, the cell differentiation processes, describes uh, how we build these embryo networks. So this was in biosystems. And then in the same issue of biosystems, we published a paper on the emerging connectome and C. elegans embryogenesis. So this is the paper that talks about the neural connectome and development. So this is an example. This tree just kind of gives us these distance thresholds, and this is this is an exercise in looking at the different subtrees that we can build. Uh, these are lineage trees that we can build from these networks. So we can map the lineage trees of the network topologies so that they don't look like these hairballs that don't mean anything. And so we can see that there, uh, there are these sort of overlaps between lineage trees looking at these different um, uh, network topologies. So we build a network at each level of division and then we look at the the mem their memberships in different developmental or lineage tree subtrees. And so we can see that there's overlap, but it's not completely, uh, you know, mushed together. But it's also not completely separate. So that's interesting because that means that there's a lot of, and this is, a, again, this distance metric. So we're looking at, like, the intersection of these two sort of modules. Sometimes they're separate and sometimes they're not. Uh, so we, but we can find all sorts of new types of topologies doing things like this. So, you know, we talked about, random networks versus scale-free versus small world. Uh, 
And those are fine for like generic networks. So when people look at like transportation networks or uh, connectomes or, uh, you know, social networks, they find these three types of network topologies. But when we're dealing with uh, uh, connectomes that are connected to say like a lineage tree that might have their origins in a very few cells, so a very few number of cells where there isn't really a uh, topology to speak of, but then you get the emergence of this complexity, this organization. How do we describe those? And so one of the things we've done, and we haven't really put a paper out on this, but there are new types of topologies that we can sort of hypothesize exist. And we don't really know, but we know from what we deal with in the embryo, what we deal with in terms of cell lineage, and what we deal with in terms of the... Um, you know, merging these two types of networks, that there are a number of possible new types of uh, connection regimes. So one of them is this feature-rich network. And these are topological features that capture fractals and fluid dynamics. So these are types of networks that are like, like these embryo networks, which are spatial in nature, that capture spatial relationships. But they also capture other things that are reliant on spatial relationships, like fluid dynamics or fractal organization. So when you have like a number of cells that are, you know, kind of clustered together, maybe that's a product of fluid dynamics. Or maybe there's fractal organization where you get a, uh, a ring of cells and then a smaller ring of cells and a smaller ring of cells and so forth. We can capture all those relationships with embryo models because they're essentially uh, representations of spatial organization. Um, and by the, for that matter, so are connectomes if you, if you uh, use a certain criterion for them. Uh, they also have this idea of multiple world topologies. And so these are different processes and structures captured in an n-partite network, which means that they have multiple parts. So in, one of, in the embryo networks paper, you know, we've talked about the bipartite network, which are two different, uh, you know, uh, two different uh, sort of uh, graphs that are connected together. So if you have dividing cells, a bipartite network makes sense there. But in the case of our lineage trees, we have uh, actually C. elegans has eight uh, sublineage trees that have founder cells at the eight cell stage. And so that's important in the development of tissues and the development of subsystems like the germline. And so we can actually look at those, uh, those sublineages and the relationship between those sublineages. So we have these n-partite networks that emerge. And then those n-partite networks uh, have weak connectors. So for example, the germline and the, uh, you know, some of the other tissues that form uh, that don't necessarily have functional connections, have other types of spatial connections or other types of signaling connections that we can capture using this type, you know, this multiple worlds uh, connect, type of connectivity, and it, it's somewhat informative. And we'll, as we'll see, there's another way to approach this, uh, which, which we've uh, written on other presentations and papers. Um, and then finally, semi-integrated networks. And again, this is going to come up later. So multiple worlds and semi-integrated networks are going to come up uh, in, in some of our the work I'm going to present next. Uh, the semi-integrated networks are interrelated phenotypic modules and functional systems. So this would be like the connectome emerging out of the somatic network and then coexisting with each other uh, in adulthood. So this is a concept called divergent integration. And this divergent integration goes back to these two last two types of topologies, multiple worlds and semi-integrated networks. It's basically capturing the overlap between different types of networks, the overlap between uh, lineage trees and networks, and then representing this in a way that, that says, you know, there, there's this undifferentiated mass of cells that then emerge, you know, from that you get different functional systems that emerge, like a connectome and maybe a set of uh, tissues and maybe, you know, a generic uh, uh, somatic module that, you know, of different types of cells. So there are different types of so divergent means that things are diverging, but integration means that they still remain connected together as a single organism. So they don't just form their own organisms or they don't form their own subsystems that don't communicate with one another. It's an important concept because these networks are 
the thing about network theory is it often is good at characterizing things that are both uh, internally connected and have weaker connections with other subsystems. And that's one of the powerful things about network theory, so that it allows you to capture that relationship in a nice visualization. So this visualization shows you uh, single cells. This is a three-dimensional sort of animation of this three-dimensional graph I showed earlier. So this is a network at different uh, levels of, with nodes from different levels of the lineage tree. So this is where cells are at the same level or one level apart, two levels or three levels apart. So this red line, for example, are, are cells that are three levels apart. So AB and ABPLP. ABPLP is three divisions away from AB. So that's that red connection. Um, AB, ARP, and AB are connected. And there's a long connection because they're a long distance away. They've had three, uh, three sort of cell generations to move apart. And so indeed, that's what you see here. You see these cell centroids, and then you see the cell bodies, which are in a, in a sort of approximations of where they are in the embryo. But it shows that these cells are in the embryo. They're moving around. They have relationships at different levels of differentiation. I didn't put the cell for AB, but that's like the sort of the anchor point for that part of the, uh, this is like the, um, the anterior end of the a worm. So AB is sort of the anchor point there. But Again, like these are just approximations of position and, and approximations of these relationships. So um, this is what this looks like. Now, this is a regular network. This is where you each node represents a cell, and there's no differentiation of function or of category. So every cell has its own node, and they're connected usually through some you know very uh, simple criterion like distance, or you know it could be. Uh, layer of uh, the lineage tree, or it could be signaling molecules or something like that. And you can get a nice uh, topology that's spatially, uh, you know, relevant and, you know, inter it may give you interesting things. But there are other, another set of tools called hyper networks or hypergraphs. And so hypergraphs are very different. And they actually, they allow us to break into some of these uh, changes in category and changes in, in, um, or a functional category. So um, again, this is what these uh, these uh, regular networks look like at different division levels. So this is the six at the top left. There's the 16 cell embryo. Uh, this is our th distance threshold here for, for the constructing this network. So you can see that if you take all cells in the uh, sort of at the top end of our data set, which I think is several hundred cells, uh, you get this very sparse connectivity. And these cells aren't organized. I think the AB ones are on the left, the P1 cells are on the right. So there's connectivity across uh, the posterior anterior divide and then within those two categories. You get the 32 cell at the middle, the same threshold gets a little bit more dense. 64 cell gets really dense and then we moved to a threshold of 0.95 because it was just uninterpretable at the 128 cell level, but you get this, again, you get a little bit more localization in some of these, uh, you know, regions of space, uh, but you also get strong connectivity between those two uh, anatomical poles, and then the 256 cell, which is much more dense uh, at the same threshold. So this is, these are types of patterns you can see at different levels of cell division. Now what hypernetworks do is they take these nodes and they combine them into a hypernode. So I might take a group of AB cells, for example, put them into a hypernode. Now those cells are homo heterogeneous with respect to what they're connected to, but they do allow me to group things likes by likes and then look at the connections between two of these hypernodes. And it gives me, you know, it's supposed to output a power spectrum of, uh, you know, relationships. So you should be able to take a bunch of cells, put them in a hypernode, treat them as a category or a group. And then it gives you a number of different, you know, they might change their connections and it gives you a distribution of those connection changes. So that, that's where the power of hyper, uh, note, hyper graphs come in. And so, but before we move on to that type of model, 
we need to talk about the density bifurcation model. And this really kind of lays out this idea of, um, you know, what, it, why we're interested in all of this uh, part of the, you know, building a network. So uh, one process leading to a semi-integrated network is the density bifurcation model. So these are these networks where you have different functional or spatial modules, but they're also connected together in some way. They maintain a weak connection instead of uh, tight integration. So this process of density bifurcation is basically the process of development, but this is described in terms of sort of development and then also uh, network, complex network theory. So the first step is that cells divide and migrate. And we've seen an exa examples of that in our graphs where they divide and they move around and the connectivity generally increases over time as we've seen. The second step is that cell migration enriches, enriches what they call local communities and cliques. So cliques is a technical term from, uh, from uh, complex network theory. In the paper we did on uh, embryo networks, we do a clique analysis of the embryo. We find that there are these cliques that form. Cliques are just very highly connected cells or nodes that ha are fully connected, and they're usually little sub uh, modules in the network that you can identify using an algorithm. There are also local communities, which you know typically are like you know functionally related, or they they form clusters. So cell migration enriches these type of structures. The third step is that functional function the function of cells diverge, which is differentiation. So you have a bunch of cells proliferating, and then they start to uh, take on new functions, like they become neuronal cells, or they become uh, intestinal cells, or they become germ cells. And so that divergence is important to characterize. So two interconnected networks emerge, or maybe more, if we're talking about the neural connectome versus the, uh, you know, the somatic network, then we have a neural connectome and a somatic network, and there's communication between those cells. Uh, eventually, it becomes less uh, specific between those networks and more specific within each network. But you still have, you know, they're still in the same organism. So they do have some relationship to one another. And then finally, interconnected tissue networks provide weak ties. So these interconnected networks provide weak ties. There are connections between the neural connectome and the somatic cells, just as there's a connection between your brain and other tissues. It could be through nerves, it could be through other types of things going on in the body. Uh, it could be metabolic, for example. So there are these functional interdependencies. Some of them be, can be characterized by these network models and some cannot. And so these emerging tissues have this uh, consistent interdependency. So this is the generative divergent integration model and I'm just going to lay it out with uh, an example here from an eight cell. This is a, just an embryo that I've made up uh, it's, based, it's kind of related to C. elegans, but it's just kind of a uh, cartoon. Uh, the, the one on the left is the 8 cell, the one on the right is the 24 cell. And so you can see in the 8 cell, we have fewer connections than the 24 cell. It's based on distance. So the more cells that are packed into the embryo, the more spatial relationships are going to be drawn out. So that's maybe cheating a little bit, but it shows that there's this change in connectivity. It becomes much more dense. And then the 24 cell example, we start to get a, a neuronal network. Again, not something we see in the C. elegans embryo because the neurons emerge at like 200 cells or something. But, um, well, maybe a little bit less than that. But you can see there are two categories here. And so they're connected in different ways. Um, so in the, in the eight cell example, we have just an embryo network and the connections between the nodes are this distance, the threshold between cell centroids which is the same for the 24 cell example. And then there's sparse connectivity due to the larger cell size, which I don't show here. I just show these like kind of centroids, but there's more distance between the centroids and the eight cell. And then in the 24 cell, they're more densely packed in. And a word about that, you get a lot of gap junctions between cells. And so in the neural connectome, for example, there are a lot of gap junctions that are formed and they're functional gap junctions. They do things they exchange information between cells. As the cell, as the um, the embryo becomes more packed with cells, opportunities for gap junctions to form increases. So, with that kind of uh, electrical connection or direct connection between cells, uh, 
you get this uh, higher opportunity for connectivity. So just putting into biological context, as I said here, all neurons green that share gap junctions. So in this case, the green cells are defined by gap junctions and distance, but also the blue cells. And the blue cells will have gap junctions too. It's just that they're not, this network isn't being defined by that. So that's the idea. There's actually two submodules of the white green, but that's something, yeah. So um, in any case, my point being is that there are multiple ways to have connectivity. As you get more cells, you get more opportunities for connectivity. And that's where we, but then we also have this divergent integration where different cell categories emerge where they're connected by different means, other means, and eventually those light green cells will join together in a, into a unified network and start to function as a unified network. This is actually what we see in the C. elegans connectome. We see like, you know, a bunch of things happening in the head, a bunch of cells emerging in the tail, and then there's this connection between the two later. So this is just a lesson as to how to link networks to uh, anatomy and morphology, but also how they diverge in terms of function and then how they stay connected as a whole organism. So I'm going to revisit this part here. Uh, what if the correct model is not a complex network? So we've been talking about complex networks and the different connectivity regimes and what they represent in biology. What if the correct model is not a typical complex network? And I talked about there are different, maybe different types of connectivity regimes in an earlier slide, but this may not even be like the right way to think about it. So there are different ways that people have kind of approached networks. And this is uh, where, you know, we're thinking about like these growing networks. We're thinking about the organization very broadly. And so how do we represent these things? So this again, this is going back, uh, stepping back from this hyper uh, graph model to just regular old hairball networks, uh, which each, you know, each node is a cell and everything. Uh, so we have new world networks, which I mentioned before. We have chimeric states which are simultaneously coherent and incoherent. So we have this idea of divergence of state uh, where we have networks of two different states and you know they're coherent and incoherent states. Uh, then we have network connectivity that prefers influences or, or network connectivity preferences influences later activity in a ways that affect symmetry. So this paper talks about symmetry as a mean uh, functional organizational uh, principle. We have small world networks, but those that are constrained by spatio-temporal sampling. It's from the journal Chaos. And again, that's thinking about these small world networks, but in that spatio-temporal relationship. And then finally, this paper where this figure at the, on, at the right is from, which are generalized hierarchical signatures. And you see how the primate visual system compares to a most sequential network organization, which is just the next cell in the sequence of cells in this circular graph, a randomized graph, and the most distributed graph. And each of these topologies have a cost. So there's a cost to each of these types of wiring diagram. And that type of, that cost is actually a constraint on what kind of a topology emerges. So, new, you know, like we talk about small world networks, that's usually uh, uh, an efficient type of organization for hierarchical networks. But like in something like the nervous system, something like the visual system, maybe that's not the best, uh, you know, things that cost the least to, to develop. So we think about this in terms of metabolism and evolution. What is the cheapest type of network to uh, evolve or show up in development? Is it something that's very simple and local, or is it something that's distributed? And we have to think not only about energetic costs, but like the cost of information processing as well. So there are a lot of considerations here. So I put this slide in to, to just drive home the point that these networks can be wired in a number of different ways. We've just shown a small subset of uh, this work that's possible. And so one of the things we're trying to capture, here, we step back and look at the big picture. They're trying to capture a lot of these processes that are occurring in the embryo. The embryo is very dynamic, and you see these folding and buckling events, and you see migration of cells, 
and you see all sorts, this is from the zebrafish neural connectome. And you see the zebrafish embryo, the cells are moving around forming these, you know, like things like neural crests and they're buckling and they're forming different structures. Um, this is all like, you know, the process that we're trying to capture these networks. So it looks different than a lot of the networks I've shown because it doesn't show this dynamical aspect to it. And so this is the kind of thing we want to form. And so we can see that as this zebrafish embryo is developing, you not only get cell movement, but you get uh, things that form like a nervous system. You get different structures that form. And that may or may not be, uh, you know, due to, well, there may be a lot of different functional processes going on here. But at the end of the day, what we want to do is we want to characterize from like a sort of a homogeneous set of developmental cells to all these different structures. So how do we do that? Well, we don't do anything as sexy as this picture where there's this animation and it's very attract visually attractive, but it's not telling us exactly what we want to know. So we developed this developmental hypergraph method. So these developmental hypergraphs are the hypergraphs that I mentioned. So each of these nodes have a number of different cells in them. So indeed, you can see the numbers next to the nodes. And the, the bigger the uh, node, the larger the number, it just means that there are more cells in it. So this is, we're going to show you a number of these different models. And it's, we're going to model cell division and differentiation in, you know, like it's a C. elegans-like organism or a C. elegans-like differentiation or uh, lineage tree. And so we're going to look at how these different uh, subtrees emerge and subtissues emerge and so forth. So this is mosaic development. So this is, again, restricted to this type of deterministic development where we know what uh, lineage tree, what kind of cells a lineage tree is going to produce. We can track all the cell fates. And we, we can start embryogenesis off at this one. At the top right, there's this tree that starts with a one. And the subtree on the right hand side of that starts with a one. And that's our assumption that embryogenesis or maybe a sublineage begins at a single hypernode. So that single hypernode is a single cell in it. And so that's, that's where we're starting from. And then sublineages are defined by cell type. So when a new cell type emerges, like a neuronal cell type, this graph branches. So you can see the branching here at, and at the top right, we have one, two, four, and then there's a branching seven and one. Seven being one type of cell, one being a new type of cell, this germline. And this, you know, it starts with the developmental stem cell for that uh, sub, you know, that new branch. And then those cells start to proliferate in that uh, space. So that's, that's how these are set up. And you see this again and again. You see this on the bottom where you have 28 to 48 to 3. So that represents a doubling of cells roughly. Uh, it's a little bit more, a little bit less than a doubling, but it's, um, you know, it's basically a bunch of division events. Some are asymmetrical, but most are, you know, uh, like a binary division. And then you get from 28 cells to 51 cells. So you get this division event, 48 of them go to one sublineage, three go to a new sublineage, and then those cells divide multiple times to 50. It actually it doesn't divide multiple times necessarily. It's uh, getting an exchange from 48, which is this previous sublineage, and these cells are dedifferentiating and moving into this new sublineage. So you can see that there, there's a lot of stuff going on in development. You have these division events, they're contributing to these new categories. Sometimes there's exchange between the categories. And then we can count all that in this representation. And so cells can transition between subgraphs, uh, what we call anastomoses, which are these uh, connections between two different systems, as shown here on the right, which I just explained. So one of the ways we've also been able to characterize this, especially in terms of the formation of connectomes, is by looking at first pluridynamics, or what we call epigenetic strategies. And so this is where cells are actually engaging in different strategies, and we don't want to assume that they have cognition, but they do have these rules that they use to sort of sort themselves and connect into these networks. They may also sort themselves into these hypergraphs as well, this way.
And so this is based on the idea of first mover advantage. Um, stack over competition, if you're familiar with that economic concept, is what it's based on the idea that there are things that go first and things that go second. And that sort of forms this constraints on the rest of the cells. So in this case, we're looking at their time of uh, origin. So, you know, these are in minutes. So these cells uh, have, you know, there are different ways that these cells are organized. Uh, there's a network of cells that emer emerge at different times in development, and they connect into this network by, you know, simple rules. So maybe the one that's first born has to connect, make the first connection to whoever they want to connect to. And then you get the next firstborn that connects and so forth. And so this is, in, in game theory, this is called a first player advantage or, uh, you know, and it constrains the second player and it constrains subsequent players. So you, what you do is you get these different strategies that emerge. And these are just like XOR and XOR exclusive or these are based on logic gates and PN coupling is based on uh, the terminology in this paper. Frontiers in Cellular Neuroscience that was uh, from 2020, and it kind of lays all this out. So this isn't this doesn't make a lot of sense right now, but if you read the paper, it'll make more sense. Um, but what it does in the connectome is it, it uh, identifies potential pre- and post-synaptic relationships, and it yields various strategies for establishing connections between cells. And so we can do this with individual cells or hypergraphs, or sorting cells into hypergraphs using different rules. Um, we can observe like, you know, different cell differentiation, but we don't necessarily, you know, that, that kind of data is kind of hard to understand. A lot of, in C. elegans, it's not necessarily hard to understand, but in other organisms, cell fate is very, uh, very fluid. And so, you know, we, we have, want to understand what's driving that. And so some of these models might help in terms of uh, finding categories that fit what's going on in those embryos. So this is an example of first mover dynamics in an embryo. This is a C. elegans like embryo. Again, you get these sublineages that get established. And then the first mover is, uh, so in the, in, oh, let me go through this figure. Um, so the, the top left, there's this first move, which is a division into two cell types, one and two. That division, in terms of its size, is asymmetric, so one is bigger than two. So one is the first mover in terms of dividing into three cells, which one divides into two cells and two doesn't divide. Since one moves first, they have these two cells, and two has one cell, so then two divides, but it can't take up any more room than it already has. So it's constrained to that smaller volume, and so the two cells that uh, result from two are smaller. And so the fourth move then is this asymmetric division of one of the cells that came from one, and they take up room in, in the embryo in a certain way. And then there's uh, subsequent divisions, and you get these moves that keep constraining the volume of the uh, sublineages so that they have, by the eighth move, you have more these anterior than posterior cells, or more one cells than two cells, and they take up more volume. And so this is a way that we can get structure out of these embryos. And of course, we can build networks, and we can build hypergraphs out of these as well. So these subsequent moves constrain the what happens in the embryo. So what I'm saying here is that one of the take-home messages is that if you start off with a first move that's asymmetrical, it will shape what happens in the rest of embryogenesis. If you start off with a symmetrical sort of strategy where there's no asymmetry, uh, then you know that doesn't necessarily have an effect on later development. But it's interesting thinking about like different modes of development and thinking about what ifs in development. So you know, what if we had this sort of early asymmetrical event? What would happen to the embryo? Or what would happen if there were no asymmetric events? Would it just basic? Would the lineages and sublineages be evenly matched? And would we even get any structure at all? So this is work again from this biosystems paper in 2018, and it's very relevant to networks. So along with networks, we're going to capture embryo dynamics, and I showed the example of the zebrafish embryo uh, before. This is uh, an image of uh, 
an embryo that's divided. This is a, on the right, we have a Drosophila embryo, which is this long germ, which is different than the zebrafish or the sea elegans in terms of how it differentiates and forms a, a putative embryo network. So you get these different things like furrows forming in the body of the embryo that are, uh, they have to be dealt with differently, I guess, than sea elegans or, or zebrafish. So there's different structures in different embryos that we want to understand. And the spatially localized differentiation, these patterns are actually, you know, we want to be able to characterize them. We've talked about maybe game theoretic models. We've talked about network models. We've talked about hypergraph models. So these are all kind of the reason I'm throwing these models out here and talking about all these different uh, concepts is because we have a lot of variation we need to capture. So this is what we want to capture, embryo dynamics. We also want to capture spatial dynamics and, and what's happening in space and time. So this is where we get into uh, in, embodied hyper or embodied developmental networks. So, you know, it's enough just to say that this is a generic development. It's another thing when you have a specific type of body that's uh, we're trying to capture, recapitulate. So in this Drosophila embryo, it's very specific to Drosophila and maybe some other flies that are like Drosophila, but it's very different from our other uh, organisms. So having an embodied developmental network is actually important because it allows us to embody this uh, process in a specific anatomy, in a specific set of rules. And so uh, an embodied hypernode, which is something that we're drawing from our work on uh, hypergraphs, uh, an embodied hypernode is a generic reservoir for individual nodes, a context-dependent spatiotemporal unit, or an epistemological container. So these dots in this uh, in this circle represent these embodied hypernodes, and these contain different cells or different things. Uh, it's it's a context-dependent unit. It exists in space. It exists in time, and it has some context. It either has like cells from a specific functional category or specific structural category or whatever. This is kind of underscores these connections between network science, category theory, and branching theory that we've discussed. Uh, connected hypernodes is linked processes of interac interaction. So this goes uh, to the idea that um, we have these linked processes, they're divergent and yet they're linked together. And so we've described that using sort of a qualitative network theory approach and we can attach statistics to that, but we want to be more explicit in what those connections are with respect to like diverging function over development. So this gives us another way to do that. And so these, these uh, cells here, these hyper nodes will produce a spectrum of cell variation for a given category or type. Even though they may be in a specific functional or structural category, they have other they exhibit a lot of uh, diversity in terms of what other cells are connected to or you know what other kinds of things that they express maybe uh, gene expression wise or you know behaviorally so there's a lot of variation underlying these nodes and we can look at that with these power spectrums um, again more on de embodied developmental networks these are networks that are embodied with major anatomical features uh, so they're embedded with ma within major anatomical features. So it could be this neural network or the somatic network. We can further define embodied networks by tuning, turning to examples from embryogenesis and neural development. So in embryogenesis, we get the formation of a newly born tissue type, and organs are characterized as discrete temp spatiotemporal processes, as we've mentioned. And so our networks are defined by the head and the tail and the uh, different sides of the anatomy, and we sort of did that with our standard embryo networks, except for the fact that we really want to focus on this information about which end is up, which end is down, and then maybe the function of these cells. So we'll see, I think, in the next slide where the, how this function works. You know, there's things that kind of go into the body in the front, get out of the body in the back, or that when the embryo is moving, we might want to characterize that movement along with the connectivity. So that's important. Neurodevelopment then ties that together by modeling a small connectome and an embodied agent as it grows and initiates sensory motor behavior. So we can actually embed this small connectome into an agent, uh, not just a network, and see what it looks like when it's moving around. So it's not just the network that we want to embody in a 
you know, anatomical context and then maybe ask the question, what happens when this embryo moves around? Or what happens when the cells move around in the embryo? Uh, what, what kind of transformations are possible? We also have this aspect of neurodevelopment where we can actually model what happens to a developing connectome as it's encountering its uh, environment. So this next slide is an example of uh, an embodied hypergraph in terms of the uh, lineage tree. And so we can see that we start with a single cell and anatomical structure type is along this axis. So we have a somatic phenotype, a neural connectome, and a reproductive tract. We have neural precursors in the middle here. We have an embryo network down here, which is the precursor to the somatic phenotype. And then we have this germline, which is a precursor of the reproductive tract. This comes from even a more generic set of uh, divisions, so the 32-cell embryo and the 8-cell embryo. And so as you can see, the, all of these uh, circles have a number of cells in them. The cells are connected to other cells, but we don't make that differentiation in this graph. This is just like a tree that goes upward in branches. But there are little networks in, in each of these nodes. And they're actually connected maybe to things like the neural connectome. And so we have these exchange points here. So this is what this looks like. This is over time, so this is going upwards in time. So this is what these uh, hyper graphs look like, these hyper networks. And then this is an example of a spatial hyper graph. So this is where we have two different layers where we have a cell division, 128 cell stage to 256 cell stage, and we go from one layer to another. And you can see it's not just that there's exchange between categories, but there's exchange over time. And so we have a cell division event where the number of cells double in a certain category or triple, and we get these circles which represent subgraphs. And so this is what this looks like in a spatiotemporal context. So this is what we talk about when we talk about these anastomoses. These are subgraphs of selected connectivity. So if we look at the human heart, we see that they're different chambers of the human heart. They're connected through little uh, passageways. And that's exactly what we see with graphs. We have these different functional units. And these are hyper uh, graphs. So these all contain cells within them. They're connected. Uh, these cell groups are connected. And then there are these subgraphs that are connected through these selective uh, connections that are much like the anastomoses in an anatomical object. And this is a Drosophila embryo showing this in, in, a, in an embodied context where we have different structures that are uh, connected together through different means, but also separate. And so this is an example, finally, of how these embodied networks are embodied in an in individual uh, sort of functional network. So this is an example of sort of an embodied agent where we have an input and an output. We have these hyper nodes that have cells within them. They're connected uh, between one another. And these numbers just represent the number of cells in each node. So these number of cells uh, increase, but you also get new intermediate nodes as development proceeds. And then finally, you get this very densely connected hypergraph here that's functionally uh, you know, much more complex than this first graph. This is the growth of a simple connectome between sensors I and effectors O. So you can build these embodied networks as a way to look at information processing. And so here we have these uh, different types of relationships between the, uh, as this network grows, you know, how the number of cells, uh, you know, doubles and quadruples over time. This is. So we have a couple of rules that come from this. Uh, the first is proportional temporal branching, which is where we have uh, this branching event from 35 cells to a doubling, roughly. And we have contributions of this doubling to each of these hyper nodes. So we have, in the first net node, we have 35 cells. In the second node, we have 54 cells and 16 cells. These are distributed in different amounts over this uh, this doubling is distributed in different amounts across these different hypernodes. And you can see this in an example from a, uh, a network. So we start at 28, we go to 48, and we go to 3. And we have two different sub-networks here that originate from a single network. So this is proportional temporal branching. Uh, so this is just one of our principles that we've gotten from this work. And there are other 
principles that we've kind of derived, but I'm not going to show here. So finally, we talk about connectomes and we talk about tensegrity networks. So tensegrity networks are networks of cells that are joined together and they're held together in a structural uh, stability, in, in a sort of a superstructural stability by the forces that are sort of acting against them. So if we compare a connectome and a tensegrity network, a connectome is connected by neuroactivity. So it could be a gap junction, it could be a synaptic uh, connection, and it's basically communication between the cells, either electrical or chemical. In a tensegrity network, we have a structure that is structurally super stable, and it's held together by different elements in the network being held together by uh, connections, but these connections transmit forces. So the structural elements, which are the nodes, have this sort of uh, the existing compression, and then the connections exist in tension. So in cells, this is often uh, where we have things like uh, microtubules that are the uh, nodes that act in compression, and then act in molecules that act in tension. They hold together everything. So this is a concept from uh, architecture that's been applied to biological systems like biological cells. And what's interesting about tensegrity networks is they follow the rules of these embryo networks to some extent. And I just described to you like a single cell, but organisms can be held in this sort of dynamic tension as well. And so connectomes can exist inside of these tensegrity networks. And in fact, it could be that connectomes are in some organisms, perhaps, or agents, connectomes might actually be a critical part of a tensegrity network. Um, we haven't really gotten too far into our tensegrity network work, but it's uh, this is an interesting concept. It's just basically this idea of the phenotype uh, and its structural integrity across development and how that plays a role in the organism's shape. So we could actually merge all these types of networks together. We can merge connectomes and tensegrity networks. They're basically two different types of connection matrices. Uh, the connectome is W I sub I J, which is the coactivation between neurons. The tensegrity network is C sub I J, which is the force transmittal along biological struts. And these two different types of networks can coexist in the same anatomy. We can also have our embryo networks and lineage hypergraphs within this network, so this is a little bit different. This is, in this case, we have W sub IJ, which are the spatial proximity of developmental cells. So our embryo networks can be generic with single cells representing the nodes, or hypergraphs with hypernodes, which are multiple uh, cells, or multiple uh, classical nodes in a single hypergraph node. So we can do all those types of representations to represent what's going on in the body and Morph, morph, uh, morphogenesis and, and things like that. We can also use these tensegrity networks, which again are these, uh, you know, they, they, they sort of describe the state of stability of this organism. And so we can put all this together, we can build these different types of networks, and these different types of networks interact in different ways, both spatially, structural, spatially and structurally, but also functionally, and contribute to a, a an integrated organism, an integrated uh, embryo, which actually becomes an integrated organism. And so in future directions, we're working also on uh, graph neural networks and looking at how we can build graph neural networks from embryo data. And graph neural networks are interesting because they're these embeddings that you can develop from the data. And they can represent different spatial relationships or other types of relationships from the data that we couldn't necessarily come up with on our own as we abstract away the phenotype to get these build these networks that we just talked about. So uh, GNNs actually can discover new network relationships within the data. And so we're working on this. It's, we have a platform and open source development for this, and it's based on the cell tracker GNN that's been published. Um, but this is something that is really an interesting new direction. It basically generates the nodes dynamically and then generates the connections between them. And so this is something that we can use for a number of different network applications as we move forward. So thank you for your attention.